joining me, Andy Tilstra and Karen Tilstra to this session. So Andy and Karen, thanks for being with us. I'll do a short introduction on both of them. Andy got his Master's of Social Science and Anthropology from the University of Chicago. He has done research on, on the public space in Chicago and how it relates to power dynamics. Andy runs a podcast that has over 10,000 downloads and uh, hope to be a guest one of these days on Andy's podcast. <laughs> Karen holds a doctorate in innovation and transformation and is a licensed educational psychologist. She has helped businesses, universities, government and healthcare organizations create innovation labs and develop their innovation teams. She believes we need to stop taking ourselves so seriously and really scale innovation for social and financial value creation around the world. So excited about your session. Thanks for being with us today. Oh, awesome. thanks for, uh, we're happy to be here. Um, <laughs> and uh, so. Thank you so much, Jose. <laughs> All so right. we're happy well. to be here today. And um, our goal today is to uh, show you some of the things we've learned from Innovation Labs. But also, if you don't have an Innovation Lab, there's five things we want to share with you that anyone, anywhere can start uh, applying in their life or building up skill to help them uh, inv ignite innovation anywhere. But if you do have an innovation lab, this is a, a temperature check to see if the five things that we present are being uh, utilized in your lab and how you might utilize them even to a larger degree. Yeah, so let's just get into it then. So yeah. we wanna ask, what exactly can an innovation lab do for you or for a hospital? Now we did send a video to Jose and Brian um, if we could show that video now, Jose, that would be optimal. All Sorry right. I, I think, uh, Andy, you have the sharing controls now, and you are the one who can play that. So if you go under the sharing tab, under All show right. screen, the video should be in there. Okay. Awesome. So show screen. Sorry, we probably should have done this right before. Oh, no. All right, so show application, show screen. Ah, there it is. Thank you so much. All You're right, welcome. so let's. Prototyping as we go. Is it, is it on? It's starting to load. Okay. Yeah, this is our first time showing a video at Beatos. So again, hey, we're gonna talk about this rapidly, uh, rapidly prototyping and <laughs> seeing what can happen. No, on my end, I don't see the video playing right now. Andy, see if there's a little button there to hit play on the video. Ah, okay. Uh, do I have to make it full screen or will it be full screen automatically? Uh, you, it's automatic. Just, It's just about uh, playing the video okay. to start. Here we go. Two words can change your life. I do. You're fired. It's malignant. There's two other words, simple rather mundane and very common that when used together can also change your life and change the world. These two words, yes and. Innovation to me is inspiring because it means you're going somewhere new that no one has been before. The concept of Phil came when Florida Hospital was looking to really become more intentional about innovation, innovation process and cycles. Dr. Karen Tilstra brought on the leaders of the Florida Hospital Organization to begin this innovation lab. Their vision was to have it open to everyone in the hospital. From the moment you walk in, you can just feel the energy. We've seen people work together who haven't worked together. We've seen a culture of innovation emerge where we never thought possible. Phil is embedded in the center of Florida Hospital. It just made sense because all you have to do is step out directly onto these units and you're getting empathy. A very rapid, self-correcting innovation model that connects with the end user to experience what the end user experiences. So they're moving beyond their habitual ways of thinking and acting. This is so powerful because solutions are coming from where they need to, from the front lines where the people are actually encountering the problems. Chief Strategy Officer David Banks said the Innovation Lab would be successful if it fostered a culture of innovation across the healthcare continuum. So far, we've had over 300 doctors, 400 administrators, and 1,200 nurses come together to collaborate and redesign the patient experience. When Phil began, the focus was on internal projects. As word spread, more and more outside companies began to co-create at Phil. Over the past five years, Phil has run over 500 projects, and each one has had a unique challenge with the potential to revolutionize healthcare. 
we were able to reduce our cycle time from 63 days down to 41 days, and we were also able to increase our retention rate from 46% to 75%. We redesigned the pediatric surgery experience, and parents are now reunited with children the moment they come out of surgery. Adventist Health System brought together 40 people from across the country to fundamentally transform how we transition patients from one care setting to another. We went from collecting maybe 10% of our uninsured patients to 25. We eradicated patient falls for 108 days, catapulting us from last place in the hospital to amongst the top five units. Our public policy department was able to increase the readership of our publications by nearly 50%. We shaved 10 minutes off of our stroke process, which means we saved 20 million neurons a patient. 52% of our patients now are finding their car that were not before. The Health Village Fitness Center has seen a 40% increase in engagement in just one year. Our communication with nurses on HCAP scores have been above the 75th percentile for three months in a row. We're seeing 37% more patients a day, which enabled us to hire another full-time employee. K-Tape has found four new innovative applications for kinesio tape and medicine. We've increased pre-op readiness for our inpatient surgical patients from 40% to 80%. Over 1,200 students are now literate in using design process to solve complex problems. We went from an average of 37 complaints a month to zero. We're now seeing 88% of patients in seven minutes. And we've never done that in the years and we've tried many different things. It's for the patient that we ultimately do a better job at what we're doing. So if you gotta ask, what do you do? You <laughs> improve patient care and save lives. The past is no longer predictive, the present is fleeting, and the future is where we need to be. All right. Well, that's a that's a video that kind of explains what Phil used to be called Phil the Florida Hospital Innovation Lab. Now it's called the Advent Health Innovation Lab, and some of the outcomes that came from that. Um, and that was actually a few years ago. We're working on a new video now to get some of the more uh, current um, outcomes. Anything you want to add to that, Karen? Well, it's just that we were uh, called the Phil team. Now we're called the A A Hill team. So marketing uh, had that a change. So we've had a lot of fun with that of the A Hills. So as you can imagine. <laughs> Oh man, keeping so, it professional, already. Innovation Labs. <laughs> so why yes, Innovation so. Lab? We, we want to ask that again and also give some cornerstones that Innovation Labs can can really uh, address in the hospital. So um, I have the belief that every organization can benefit from an Innovation Lab. It's actually a viable Innovation Lab, not just Innovation Theater. A lot of Innovation Labs fail because they become Innovation Theater, but an intentionally designed innovation lab that stays focused on the purpose of innovation can really transform the people in the organization and make an organization relevant and sustainable. And there's a couple things um, that uh, I, I wanna just touch on if, before we get into our five points, that uh, if you have an innovation lab, notice these things and see how, how, how they're working for you, or if you don't have an innovation lab and you want to innovate in your area, just keep these things in mind. Number one with innovation is all about the top leader. The top leader has to be bought in. And what I like to say, uh, any place that I've helped start an innovation lab is working with the top leader and having the top leader have the mindset that everyone in the organization has permission and responsibility to innovate. And some people might say, wait a minute, wow, that just sounds too much. Wherever you are, innovation can uh, be small or large. So top leadership, having a voice to innovation that also will lead to the second thing that creates a low barrier, easy access to uh, the whole innovation approach because innovation oftentimes is defined too narrowly. So having a low barrier, easy access way for people to connect with innovation and by, th by that's made possible by having an action learning approach to innovation. That means keeping innovation rooted in real life challenges or opportunities that the uh, people within the organization are facing. And it makes it very doable. People uh, like a, a rising tide raises all ships. And then once the uh, <clears throat> people have innovated or created something large or small, share their story. Stories can be so inspiring. Uh, we've just seen it over and over and over again when people can share their innovation story. And we've just been blessed in the different labs we've built to leadership provides a way for that to happen. Leadership forums and summits and ops forums or department meetings 
to have the people who worked in the project share their innovation story in a very rapid story arc that we help them learn. So these are just four cornerstones that I believe make, if you have an innovation lab or you don't have an innovation lab, but your department or yourself wants to be an innovator, top leadership, low barrier, easy access, action learning, and share your story. We could talk, we could do a whole college class on each one of those, but yeah. that's just a, just a groundwork because the five things we want to share with you that we have found in our innovation lab, um, both in the Advent Health Innovation Lab and other innovation labs that we've helped get going, these five things really mattered and they're simple. And I think they're things you're going to already know, but you might not have thought of them in this way. And so um, we're excited to share these five things with you. And again, if you have an innovation lab, just see how you're doing in your lab with these. If you don't, you can take them and use them right where you are. So five learnings from the field. Awesome. Uh, and these, all the pictures are real pictures from our own experiences in our labs and different <laughs> innovation projects. So, right. The first one is innovation is not business as usual. You were born to break from the herd. Can we can we unpack that a little bit, Karen? What does that really mean? Right. So one thing I've learned in all the different uh, innovation experiences I've either led or been involved with is people often forget this. Innovation is not business as usual. We should make innovation our business as usual. But to keep that in mind is it requires that you embrace the fact you were born to break from the herd. Mm -hmm. And you might say, well, what does this mean? So first off, we tend to define innovation too narrow. So oftentimes people are doing innovative things. We don't see it because we're waiting for the big game changer that changes the world. But no, to learn to see innovation where it is. And most innovation is incremental innovation anyway. And um, when we start to see that we embrace the fact that innovation is not business as usual and you were born to break from the herd, you can embrace the fact that everyone's creative with leadership potential and that innovation should be everybody's job every day. Now, some people will say, no, that's not true. It, it can't be. But when you think about it and you really break it down, it can be. And when you get people with that mindset and they've embraced the fact that innovation is everyone's job every day, you get a very viable organization that's a learning organization. And I have a little example. Um, Mary was uh, Mary's the one in the red circle. <laughs> um, this was an innovation team I worked with down uh, in way in uh, southern Florida. Um, this was a team. It's a global team that wanted to build an innovation lab and start an innovation team. So I worked with them for a year. And Mary um, was a part of the team. And when we worked with them, worked with them every week, once a, one day a week, and we covered a lot of material. I gave them work, handout, worksheets, things like that. But Mary was working on her tablet all the time. And she created these amazing, awesome uh, kind of uh, notes on what we were doing. Now, this is just an example here on the right she created every time we met and she'd go back to her office upload them and email them to everybody these became things people really look forward to by the end of the year we had a whole book that mary had done and i i was so impressed the whole team people started hearing it at, hearing it about around their organization they were saying mary you know this is awesome we need to actually use you in other ways and then people started saying like they'd tell their spouse and say, hey, we've got this person here who can really capture these notes in very innovative ways. This example we are showing you is the simple example. She did some awesome things, but it, she just did it naturally. <clears throat> so I said, Mary, this is really cool what you're doing. And she said, oh, it's just, it's so easy for me. I love doing it. And the reason why I love the example of Mary is she didn't do what was usual. So innovation was is uh, not business as usual. And she also broke from the herd. She created her own thing. And it's really become quite a viable uh, skill she has. And so Mary is just one simple example of what you can do breaking from the herd. I encourage I, everyone to try to do so, whatever, whatever your skill is just or your talent. Just share absolutely. it. You'll be amazed what can happen. I want to add on to that really quickly that that Mary probably didn't think what she was doing was revolutionary in any way, or even maybe something that was even worthwhile sharing. Right. But by jumping into it, approaching it, and just creating, and then following the energy and sharing it with her team, that became such a value, such a value and a, a an addition to the team that it really created something innovative and something that she now 
can cre- uh, use as a business model or even as just another way to communicate with her team. Well, she, in fact, she kind of played it down like, oh, it was nothing, but it really was something. So yes. So the big question we want to ask you is, how will you break from the herd? How will you approach the the uncertain or the new in your own way? And we understand that we can do polls and go to meetings, but we want you to just really take these questions and really just mull over them, just digest them and just have them bounce around in your head as you go forward. Write them down, maybe put them on a post-it note on the wall. We ask ourselves these own questions. You know, after working about a decade in innovation, these questions are still pointing us in the right direction. And we still have um, a burning desire to answer them in new ways. So we'll leave you with five questions. Uh, the five points we're making. So yeah, just invite you to explore the questions because if you want a better life, ask better questions. You want better <laughs> solutions, ask better questions. So, Absolutely. Okay, um, what do we have so, next, Dan? Number two, empathize with your end user. We like to say the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Um, with empathy, well, what exactly does that mean, Karen? I'm sure you can explain well, it better than this me. This is something that's so easy to overlook and research shows that we tend to, the, if we're going to fail in innovation, it's going to be here. And so we've learned in our lab, we've done over 600 projects, taking the time to learn from the people who are experiencing the challenge or will benefit from the opportunity. So learn from your end user, experience what the end user experiences. And I like to say, take the 80-20 approach, which in this case means, 80% of, the, of your time spent in learning about the problem, empathizing with the problem or the opportunity, and then 20% of getting the idea, rapid prototyping, testing. Don't skip on this. And we have lots of examples of uh, what could have happened if they hadn't done empathy. Now, here's just two examples of empathy. The, um, the guy here on the left, he came from a team that came into our lab that they were coming from uh, scans uh, like MRIs, PET scans, any kind of scan, x-rays where children, they sometimes chest x-rays, they'll put them in a tight little plastic thing. What was that like? And interestingly enough, the team that came in had never actually gone through an MRI or they'd never been involved with children uh, going through an MRI. So we said, what ways can we actually give you an experience before you go out and experience what the end user experiences? So this is one idea they had. They said, let's get some of those tunnels and go through them. Now you might think, okay, that sounds really sappy, but actually this team, what they did is they said, we're going to stand around and watch as each of our team members go through. And when they got done, it was an interesting result that they had that didn't surprise me. They said, we were, uh, intimidated to go through. We got panicky when we were going through and coming out seemed awkward. And then that set them into a much deeper empathetic state when they went and actually worked with, got the stories from the patients. And now what about Trevor on the other side, Andy? Well, I just want to say, I think we captured the awkward moment of that man exiting. Uh, yeah. <laughs> oh man, he's a really nice guy. He said, <laughs> he said we could use this photo. Yeah. <laughs> So on the right, we have Trevor. He's actually one of the members of AHIL, the Advent Health Innovation Lab. Trevor, a great guy, exquisitely intellectual. But he's going through with a team how to reimagine the admitting process for patients in the emergency department. So what he did, he decided, I'm going to go through this as a patient. I'm going to strap a GoPro to my chest, and I'm going to really assume the patient's experience. So he went through, he told the doctor, he's like, I'm going to be doing this as a patient. Treat me as you would if I had chest pain. So we actually put uh, underneath his shirt, there's a strap around his chest. It's actually giving him uh, some chest pain. And he's going through this as if he was a patient and he's getting the full experience. By doing so, he's getting the, uh, uh, the, the, the emotional, the feeling aspect of being a patient. And he's coupling that obviously with conversation and research on the more scholarly side, but he's also going through this with the human side. What does the human feel? Sitting in this chair with this uh, clinician talking to him, what would that feel like? Does he understand it? Do they understand it? And how well is it portrayed? So these are two examples of empathy and assuming an end user mindset. So the and question- And we had, uh, oh, oh, what is, yeah, sorry. <laughs> What's oh, no, no. really going on here? That's the yeah. question that uh, burned this into your mind. What is really going on here? We had a, a large uh, surgical device company come into our lab and they had they viewed themselves above average. They had surgical devices that, that for minimally invasive surgery that uh, the base snaps to different tops. 
And so they were losing market share. So they immediately assumed it was their sales rep. So they came into our lab to write, to reimagine how they could uh, have a business model without sales reps. So we said, wait, before you do that, go get empathy. And so we set them up to observe several surgeries where their devices were being used. And as they were there, they saw that the team, the surgery team struggled with their devices because the, you had to get the right top to go with the right base, otherwise it would come on. And so they started hearing all kinds of beautiful language, like, oh, these crazy people, They're, this company just wants to sell more stuff because once we open it, we have to buy more. And they heard lots of uh, colorful language and concerns. And the doctor then at the end said, thank goodness for our sales reps. If I hadn't been for the sales reps, we wouldn't even know how to use this stuff at all. And so the team came back to our lab, shocked and said, wow, we thought it was the sales reps when actually we didn't even understand the complexity of our own devices. And so they actually created this really cool way of matching devices. They went back to their lab and did that. But again, we think we know the problem, but when we really don't know what's going on, we create solutions that nobody wants. I love that story because I think it shows our own assumptions about problems that we feel really close to and how sometimes you can you know, cut off your own hand, <laughs> your own thing that's keeping yeah. you alive by thinking it's what you should do. Um, so that's, I love that story because I think it shows really what the human mind sometimes uh, falls prey to. So number three, learning from the margins. We want to swipe left and swipe right. Uh, we want to yeah. learn both from the experts and the assumed non-experts. So what exactly does that mean, Karen? Well, when I started helping organizations build innovation labs and in healthcare, what I, what I noticed is people didn't naturally want to reach out. They weren't uh, thinking that, uh, they just weren't thinking about it. And so um, I started to realize if they could start building collaborative relationships with all kinds of people in their community, the healthcare, the hospital would be better. So we opened up a hill, um, Abbott Health Innovation Lab. We took the mindset we were going to just be open. And so before we knew it, we were connecting with the universities in town. We were connecting with the county. We we're connecting with lots of different significant uh, partners and the opportunities we had to learn to make our lab more relevant became just over uh, just astounding and we tend to also want to learn from the middle group we don't like to learn from the uh people that don't use us because they don't use us and we tend to get over connected to people who love us because they they are not going to tell us anything we don't want to hear um so make a point of learning from the margins, the people that you don't normally see. So we give have two examples of what really kind of hit home to us. Mm -hmm. Right, so the first example on the top left, that's two members of our team talking to um, one of the um, employees at another in innovation lab. And the way we got connected is we found out about this innovation lab in, in Florida called Guidewell. Um, it was actually a, a semi-innovation park innovation lab. And we were like, let's reach out to them and let's connect. They're probably too busy though. They're such a well-developed lab. So we reach out, we meet up with them and they say, oh my goodness, you it's you guys, the Florida Hospital Innovation Lab. We th we've been wanting to connect with you, but we were worried you were too busy. And we were like, we thought the same thing of you. And from that, we realized that we assumed that the expert in the field was too busy or, or in the same environment as us and wouldn't be able to interact and collaborate. But really that was an assumption that was then busted and we were able to then have a great collaboration. We still actually keep in contact with them and have got have had great outcomes on both sides. And another example of, is, oh, oh, what, yeah, go ahead. That, Karen? Yeah, this is the Blue Cross Innovation Lab and talk about awesome connections. So don't ever underestimate who you can connect with. Yeah, and there's another example of that um, overdeveloped or the expert margin that we may sometimes assume doesn't want to co connect or collaborate. Um, in University of Florida, there's the Innovation Academy. And I was able to go up there one day and interact and, and tour the facilities because I was thinking, what could I bring back to the lab and what can I learn from them? And, you know, entering the facilities, they're like, hey, you're from the Florida Hospital Innovation Lab, now Advent Health Innovation Lab. We've been meaning to connect with you. We thought you guys, you guys are doing such great work. We use you, we use your videos in our curriculum. And we said, oh my goodness, we've been meaning to reach out too. We thought though you were too busy or had the same experience as us and we didn't feel that burning desire to. But by doing that, and connecting, we were able to bust that assumption and again, create a connection that's actually still uh, developing to this day. So again, those margins of the expert that we sometimes push to the side for reasons such as they're too busy or they actually know the same amount as us, what else could we learn? But there's another margin and Karen, who's this on the right? This is Rocky, a, a local nurse who um, loved a quilt and she started to focus on 
uh, unwed mothers of, that had premature babies. She started making quilts for them. Well, uh, rocket was kind of below our horizon line, but as we started projects, uh, we had a couple projects coming in with premature uh, around the neonatal unit. And uh, one of the nurses said, you know, there's a lady here, a nurse that works here sometimes that makes quilts. And actually she's, this is in her house this picture and she has a whole big quilt is like a quilt shop and as she started going people started getting interested and before she knew it she had like seven people coming every week and they're making quilts but what we learned is she had insights into some of these supports and some of the other factors that families struggle with with the premature babies that actually the hospital didn't have and the team that we're working with didn't have and so as we found her at first the team said well she's a quilter what's she gonna know when we got we connected with her she knew so much about the, what the family's struggling with and how this the hospital when they're creating a sustainable uh support system for premature babies once they go home she became a valuable resource mm -hmm. so it's easy to miss what we we don't see and yeah. so to actually set up the lab or your innovation team or even yourself who could we connect with that can actually give us vital information and make us better. We become partners together. I just also so, want to iterate that Rocky is actually one of Karen's childhood best friends. And it, sometimes it's it could be in even that close of a circle, which is someone you've grown up with that maybe you don't see as innovative because that's just the way they are. But if you take it fresh right. perspective, they could give you in. In fact, yeah. it wasn't me that thought we should go talk to her. But when I heard <laughs> I said, oh yeah, I know Rocky. But it was a nurse that said, there's a lady that actually takes time to uh, make these quilts. Anyway, that's just a, we're trying to give you two exa two extreme examples. So, all righty. Um, so the burning so, question of what margins are you ignoring? We want to ask this a little pointedly and we ex uh, used ignoring intentionally because sometimes we can convince ourselves or rationalize who not to talk to or who wouldn't be valuable to, for input because we can see, we can rationalize them not having any impact or any context on the problem. Yes, so the next two points, four and five, we are going to actually, they're gonna be in tandem because they go in tandem. Um, so, awesome. yes. So number four, rapidly prototyping. It's and not the, about the, the five-year plan. <laughs> yes, in fact, Shark Tank says, throw away the five-year plan because now we don't know what's going on and don't assume anyone knows anything right now in this COVID world. So that you might be saying, oh, well, well, thanks a lot. What are we going to do about that? But rapid prototyping is really your ticket to a to remaining re relevant and sustainable in the future. So rapid prototyping is just failing fast and cheap, but simple, three simple things. Rapidly prototype your idea in a rough manner, right? to the, your idea, rough and uh, rapid. And the uglier the prototype, the better, because people will interact with uh, very rough prototypes very rapidly. If you make it too pretty, they might say, yeah, that's okay. And then they're thinking, why did they ask me sooner? Anyway, uh, so we wanna show you just a couple of uh, two examples of prototypes that we're talking rough and easy. And we deliberately sh are showing you the one on the right. Uh, Andy, you wanna share about that one? Yeah, well, uh, the one on the right or the one on the left? I mean the left, sorry. No worries. Um, so the, the photo on the left actually portrays three teams that came together during one of our facilitation programs where we actually were trying to uh, uh, help their university run a little bit more effectively. And you can see on the table, there's there's books, construction paper, popsicle sticks, wire cleaners, Play-Doh, glue, um, really anything very tactile and malleable because we wanna have those ideas come out very, very low resolution, very rough, but they are very connected to the idea and the empathy gained from the end user. Remember, this project innovation is 80% empathy. It's 80% problem learning and 20% problem solving. So it's at this point where the actual idea starts to take form. So that's what's happening on the left side. Uh, Karen, can you give us more insight this on the project uh, that came from pediatric surgery? The uh, the surgery team was trying to improve the experience for parents. So. They made this prototype that kind of walked through a new experience they had. But the whole key was is on um, prototypes, give your end user something to interact with. Mm -hmm. So rapid and right, as you can see right there, we could talk forever about prototypes, but <laughs> having your office, just some things 
or in your, uh, your, for your department, wherever, just have some things on hand that you can rapidly prototype an idea. So one time uh, we were in Tampa, Cecil, one of my, my team members, we were over there, we were doing a presentation and they were trying to set up a stage for us. So we were kind of explaining how we thought it would be cool. No one was getting it. And so Cecil just grabbed some tape and paper and just taped some things together and said, we're thinking like this, immediately it worked make a visual, visual, tangible representation of your idea. And the person before us was speaking about this. So mm -hmm. it's, he said a lot of awesome things. So I want to go right to the next, to the right to the next thing, because it's once you build your pro prototype, you've got to get feedback. Right. So, and before we do so, we just want to ask the, have our question, uh, uh, put a punctuation into the fourth point, which is how might you become a rapid prototyper? How can you make this something where you don't just talk about the idea, you show the idea? Just how verbal, just how communicating is not 80% nonverbal. How can you make your idea communicate nonverbally? How can you make it experiential? So this is a question we just want to ask about how might you become rapid prototyper? All right. And moving on to the last point, we have a so, few minutes left. Or do you have anything you right, want to add to that, Karen? No, it's good. Right from prototyping, go right into feedback. Mm -hmm. so, so feedback Andy, is a gift. Say? Yeah. Right. <laughs> feedback is a gift. Lay it on me. Give me the facts. And we like to say this because it's something we forget all the time. And there's no such thing as bad feedback. And when you're showing your prototypes, all you have to, when you get the feedback, all you have to do is say thank you. You don't have to defend it. Mm -hmm. Just say thank you. So um, we've got a picture here of the, this part. a few members of the pediatric team went out and they took their prototype on a little trolley and they started interacting with nurses, doctors, parents. And again, they stood back and said they shared their idea and then interact with that. Now you notice on the far right, there's someone standing there writing. When you go out with your prototype, just take someone to take notes. Then you can really focus on what the end user is saying and have someone take notes with you. But remember, feedback is a gift. It's part of the iterative process. Do not underestimate the power of feedback. Mm -hmm. Always include it with your prototype because your first prototype is not your best one. Your first idea is not your best one. Feedback will get you, will bridge you to better ideas, to solutions mm -hmm. that people actually want. And so, also to add on, Oh, just to quickly add on to that, how Karen, you were saying, um, always seeks uh, feedback, including when you think you're done. That may be when you need feedback the most is when you feel like you've reached an endpoint. You're like, all right, that's it. The solution is great. It's wonderful now to implement. That might be when you need feedback the most because maybe you're missing something or maybe you're assuming well, something. And we say that the confident team that says we've got the perfect solution, we know they are the ones that need to go get feedback as quickly as possible because mm -hmm. Oftentimes our own assumptions blind us to what really is going on, but feedback is really your ticket, your bridge to relevant solutions. Awesome. So, and then the, the burning question of feedback is how might you get more feedback? How might you facilitate better feedback or a safe space for feedback? And an innovation lab is a great solution for that. It is a, 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 both a physical and a mental space where innovation and, and innovation practices such as feedback can be uh, uh, done without vulnerability or without judgment. Mm -hmm. And so these are five things. Uh, we feel that um, what we've given a lot of presentations about innovation labs, and oftentimes people will say, I, I like this, I just don't have an innovation lab. So this, what we tried to do was create uh, the five things that you can actually do without an innovation lab. But if you have an innovation lab, make sure you're going deep with these things. Right. So again, just as a recap, our five things. Innovation is not business as usual. Remember, you were born to break from the herd. Exactly. Empathize with your end users. Try to keep in mind that 80% problem learning, empathy, and 20% problem solving. That's everything else. Learn from the margins, both the highly visible and the invisible. Mm -hmm. Rapidly prototype, fail fast, and cheap to accelerate your learning and learn even faster. And feedback is a gift. Embrace feedback and when you get it, all you have to do is say thank you. Mm -hmm. And again, these are five things that we have noticed that really are what make an innovation lab effective. And we try to make it so that they are both space related and also mental space related. Whereas if you don't have the space, you can start practicing these in your workspace. They're cheap. And most of the time they're free. So thank you for joining us. And uh, remember, use these five things to keep inspiring creativity wherever you are.
Yeah. Um, so, thank you. Thank you so much. And I will, I, we have a quick little contact us. We have a website, just creativityeffect.com. Um, just our address, our email address is just Karen at creativityeffect.com or me, Andy at creativityeffect.com. Thank you guys so much for listening. Um, and let's move into the Q and A. Terrific, terrific. Great, great stuff. Uh, Karen and Andy excited, ready to turn on the button of innovation here. <laughs> and, uh, so, there are a number of questions that came up during your presentation and I'll, I'll encourage our audience to continue to ask those questions, uh, make them practical, make them contextual to where you are. And, um, and uh, some of the questions that have come up have this overall theme of, this is a great concept. How do I convince my stiff senior leadership team members to jump into the innovation bandwagon? <laughs> and, yeah. uh, so, well, so from the real <laughs> practical experience that you have, you know, how do you convince stressed out healthcare administrators to 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 take a chance on innovation, to to see innovation as a way that uh, as a, as a, as a as an approach that will help the organization? And uh, curious about what you have found to be effective in having those conversations. Well, one thing I always tell people: come visit us, and we can tell <laughs> you our story. But also, there's a lot of uh, uh, relevancy now with innovation labs. So first off, uh, they don't have to be expensive. They can be mobile. They can, you can make them for very, very inexpensively. But also with COVID is a really great example of why we need to be uh, thinking about having spaces for innovation or people who have some training in innovation that can lead uh, the low barrier easy access kind of innovation. It's just, what are we gonna do next? And to actually talk with leaders and say, could we possibly build some skill around uh, build our competency in innovation. So when things like COVID happens, we don't, we just have a, 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 I like to say a bridge to innovation aisle. We know how to get there. We have, otherwise it's a big scary moat we have to get across. But by building a bridge, just talking, uh, asking leaders how this might look. Uh, would they like to uh, find some examples, tell some stories about how innovation worked in other places? But the key is, you know, leaders oftentimes are afraid of two things. Is this going to cost me a half million dollars? No, not even close. And am I going to lose control? And mm -hmm. no, they won't either. And I yeah. and I think that there's so much out there now about innovation and how to run a viable pro, a pro, pro endeavors, initiatives, and programs that um, it, it's just it, to me it just makes so much sense that any leader when they really understand what they could do in a very disruptive world we're living in right now um well talking to them showing them some examples sharing some other stories of uh maybe people you know or call us we can help you um mm. yeah that's what we put I'm our not... contact information up there because this is we that's kind of like our main right barrier as a company is like how do we how do we make it so that it's easy to implement, but also easy for these executives who are very mindful of budgets, um, company culture, um, environment as well. How do we make it easy for them? And Karen kind of touched on that where it's, it's, it's budget, budget's the biggest thing. How can we do this? Like we only have $20,000. How do we, how do we make this happen? Or we've only have like $2,000. And that's where well, I think also, that... Research shows us clearly from Harvard, MIT, from uh, McKinsey, that leaders want, that's their top two things they one of the top two things they want innovation mm -hmm. and the research shows us most of leaders don't know how to connect with it or if they they do it's a scary process so just actually starting a conversation i have found everyone's ever contacted me to help them build a lab or build an innovation team has said we just have ha having a conversation with our uh leaders and here's the encouraging thing it's never the top leader that contacts me. It's somebody who's been working with them or talking with them. Now, I always connect with the top leader and start working with the top leader, but it's always been somebody who has really encouraged the leader to, hey, let's try this. So that's encouraging, I think. Mm -hmm. um, I had another thing I wanted to add to that. Um, I think, too, innovation is very contextual. So I think when people think of innovation, they think of an innovation lab or when they hear innovation lab, they think of high tech Da Vinci robot and like 3D printer, which is great. But that's why when we gave this presentation, we really wanted to focus on practices that could be implemented very, you know, 
for mm -hmm. virtually nothing that could be implemented anywhere. Because Innovation Lab is really more about a mental space than a physical space. A physical space is wonderful because when people enter into it, they're they're just kind of subconsciously entering into a new space mentally. But it's really the practices and the, the philosophies that create that innovation. We don't get innovation from having comfy chairs and, and bouncy balls that we sit on or, or a pool table yeah. in the break room. That's not where innovation happens. Those things are really catalysts for inspiring other mindsets and philosophies that then foster the innovation. But if you can implement these five things that we said that are virtually cheap or virtually uh, free, um, can be implemented anywhere with any one, that's when you're going to start seeing innovation take place that could then maybe lead to a, 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 a designated innovation lab physical space. Very good. Now, once you set up uh, an innovation lab, well, the other questions that have emerged here have to do about uh, what do you focus on? I mean, how do you establish priorities? What do you decide what problems to solve? How, how does that process typically work? Well, once, uh, so first and foremost, top leadership has to say, yeah, we're, we're going to support you even as, as a trial basis. You just have to get them to say, mm -hmm. yes, we're going to do this. But as a prototype, um, then what I have found to be highly effective is to, uh, I love the design thinking model. Design thinking is a very simple, self-correcting, easy to adapt innovation model that anyone can use. Mm -hmm. And so I have this low barrier, easy access theory that I think needs to be followed to get everyone involved. So I think the first thing is, is to get a little competency around an innovation model. And you can do it while you're choosing solving one of your first challenges. So um, there's a lot on design thinking on, on website. Um, or on YouTube and get a group. You can start small, get a group of people, bring in a challenge and uh, go and see uh, how design thinking works. Just tr start to find out about the challenge, go learn from the end users and then start to see what needs to be done. But start really small, choose a challenge, but get a little bit of knowledge about an innovation model. Now it could be that you're with Six Sigma or uh, some of these other models, that'll work too. But I would say check out design thinking if you're unfamiliar or um, we email us, call us. We can we can help you get that going. But um, don't be afraid to start. That's the key. Just start. Even if it's in a, a you've cleared your desk off and you've put some like prototyping things and you've gotten a way to go connect with an end user. So whoever challenge you're trying to solve, there is an end user connected to that challenge. Find them, learn from them, and then come back and start to figure out what ideas could you use, how can you prototype it, how can you get right back with them, and is this gonna work? What what feedback do you have? Uh, start small, start, start. Get just some kind of approval from your top leadership. And, uh, and sometimes Absolutely. it's not the tippy top guy if you're just trying a, an experiment. Maybe your director, maybe your VP. Just start, uh, just start. Mm -hmm. I know that sounds pretty, uh, probably harebrained, like, yeah, just start, sure, but just well, do it. <laughs> I know with um, with Phil, we still call it Phil just because it's a little easier to pronounce than A-Hill. Um, we had strategic imperatives of the company. Um, Karen, I might forget some of these. It's um, uh, create relevant and sustainable. Uh, it was it fostered doctor patient connections. Um, well, they were the, well, they keep changing. So okay, the hospital yeah, so. has like five imperatives and all projects have to align with the imperatives. That's a big yeah. deal. So make they, sure your project aligns with one of your company's the hospital's imperatives. And then really the, the key that I found when we started the first lab, my goal was to get original stories. At first we used stories from Stanford and then we just started to uh, create our own, as we experienced it, we got our own stories and shared those stories. If you start, and start with a simple project with a small team um, and try to go through the design thinking process, you can start sharing that story and it'll evoke more interest. And then you can also have something to uh, share with the top leaders if they're not already bought in. You have an example, if they're bought in, then make sure you share that story anyway, too. I don't know if that made any sense, but I, I just- <laughs> no, it did, it did. I, I just, you Very just well. gotta start. Don't overthink it. That's a yeah. thing. But uh, start, also, we have a little class on it that can help you. Start small and scale, right? That's what you say, yeah. your message is. Yeah. yeah. Low low yeah. resolution, low yes. risk. Low but res. a, it's an idea, and ideas are very infectious. <laughs> yeah. Low barrier, easy access. Think that way. Just think. Yeah. Low Excellent. res. Not a lot of money. It's 
always an awesome conversation with with the Tilstras. <laughs> <laughs> And yeah. uh, my son. Is no I just have to clarify in case anyone's wondering, Andy is my son. He's been <laughs> helping me forever. And yeah. I, I was so honored when he graduated from the University of Chicago. I invited him in to say I, I didn't I didn't think he was gonna join us, but we have a larger team, but he did. He's really uh we're very blessed to have him. Just, just in case people wondered uh, what's the relationship between you two? <laughs> he's my son. <laughs> Innovation is like a family affair, too. Well, so. it is. Oh my gosh, it is. Everything yeah. is connected. Building really trusting collaborative relationships. Yeah. So, Andy and Karen, always fantastic to connect with you, share your best practice. You have so much breadth and depth of knowledge and practical experiences in, in this area. So, we're very grateful for you to taking the time to share this slice with us today. And it's a very helpful. Lots of great com comments from the audience here on your oh, presentation. Oh, nice. Well, we hope it was helpful. I, I feel like we topic. just. <laughs> and how like important just... this topic is for healthcare as it, as it yeah. undergoes oh, uh, yeah. significant transformations in the months and years ahead. Absolutely. Yes. Josie, thank you so much. I hope it was helpful for somebody. And um, mm. it's always fun to work with you, Josie. So we'll yeah. look forward to our next time. Thank you so much, Jose. And please yeah. reach out to us. We love talking about this stuff. This is our passion. Yeah. We if love, you have we questions, love we're glad solving. to answer them too. Mm -hmm. So yeah, thanks right. everybody. I hope it was helpful and I um, hope we'll connect sometime down the road. Thank Bye. you guys. Thank you very much. Keep very, inspiring very, very creativity wherever you are. <laughs> well done. Well done. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Andy. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take a break now. And at the top of the hour, we're going to continue on the innovation topic. Uh, we're going to have Mohan Nair, who is the Senior Vice President and Chief Innovation Officer for Cambia Healthcare, talking about the concept of the innovation flywheel in healthcare. Uh, it's going to build on these concepts that Karen and Andy have shared with us. And uh, don't miss it. Top of the hour. I'll see you back soon. Thank you.